Thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming here today to hear uh, what will be a really, really interesting talk about Syria and the socio-economic context of the Syrian uh, crisis. Uh, I'd like to present to you Zaki Mashi, who is our um, Council for Australian Arab Relations sponsored speaker. Zaki has unfortunately had a very busy week. He's been in Sydney and Melbourne, and um, this is the second last speaking that you're doing. Um, so Zaki is a, uh, an economist by training, but uh, perhaps most importantly for us today, he's a co-founder of the Syrian Centre for Policy Research. Um, Syrian Centre for Policy Research is a non-partisan, not-for-profit um, think tank based in, it was based in Damascus until 2015, it's now based in Beirut. Uh, and they produce uh, work that looks at most recently the cost of the Syrian conflict in its various forms, so be it the social cost, be it the economic cost, um, and they've produced I think some of the best and most balanced reports that I've seen coming out of Syria, and at a time where um, the conflict gets more polarised by the day, I think it's important that we, we go back to the data as much as we can and look at what's going on. Um, so I will give you the floor, thank you for joining us. Yeah, Thank you Dara, and thank you all for uh, coming and uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to discuss the Syrian uh, conflict, which is actually very complicated, and uh, we always need your opinion and your point of view about this conflict as well to exchange knowledge and exchange point of view. Uh, I will present now uh, the uh, socio-economic impact uh, of the conflict, but I uh, would like first to start uh, with a brief uh, storyline of uh, the Syrian uh, conflict to go a bit beyond the mainstream of the uh, general understanding of the conflict as it is a conflict between uh, two sects, for example, or it's a conflict uh, or it's an economic conflict, a conflict between poor, rural and urban area. It's much more complicated. and. Actually, uh, we believe it's very important to uh, highlight or concentrate or start with what are the root causes of the conflict in Syria. So not to recreate and regenerate the same causes in the future so that to have another crisis in like two or three or maybe ten years. We believe that, and based on evidence, that exclusion and political oppression is one of the main cause of uh, the conflict in Syria. And when we say ex exclusion, we don't mean only political exclusion, but also uh, social and economic exclusion. As before the crisis, we witnessed an increasing gap between chronic capitalists who start to have everything and all business, which become uh, a rent-oriented economy, real estate and uh, services, especially telecommunication and banking, which was dominated by uh, the regime, the, the cousins of Bashar al-Assad. So we have this issue before the crisis. So there, there was a kind of, yeah, there was a kind of, no, I'm not on. Whoops. <laughs> Uh, there was a kind of not only political uh, exclusion, but also uh, economic uh, exclusion. This actually led, and I'm talking before the crisis, to an increasing gap between the dominant institutions and the majority of Syrian people. And we call this gap uh, in the Syrian Center of Policy Research uh, the institutional bottlenecks, where the dominant institutions cannot or uh, are not able anymore to meet the needs and aspirations of Syrian people. That's why we believe the, the social movement started in March 2001. But why in, two th in, in 2011? But why Syrian population waited till 2011? We also believe there are two factors for that. The first one is the increasing awareness among Syrian people, especially the uh, young people through social media and new telecommunication means, so they know what's happening outside, they know more their rights, they know more that uh, 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 they have right in more uh, free space for discussion and express their opinion. And the other factor is that they believe they can do it because of what happened in Tunisia 
and in Egypt and to some extent uh, in uh, Libya. So they believe that they can do it. They can change the current or the regime in 2011. But unfortunately, this social movement turned to become one of the most catastrophic conf armed conflict uh, after the uh, World War II. Why? Also, I believe here there are two main reasons for that. The first one is the brutal uh, reaction of uh, the regime against the social movement and people. And the second one is the huge uh, external intervention in the Syrian conflict. And unfortunately, all these interventions was mainly military interventions. We, we end up to have several subjugating powers, which include the political oppression, the fundamentalism and fanaticism. These subjugating powers are fighting together, supported by external actors, and they are fighting to achieve their own benefits and not the benefit of Syrian people. Uh, of course, du during the, the conflict, there was a reallocation of resources from developmental activities to violence activities. So the entire economy become violence-related uh, economy, benefiting the subjugating powers and again at, at the expenses of the majority of people. In general, the conflict is leading to uh, many, of course, negative impact. One of uh, them is fragmentation. Syria become, uh, becomes a fragmented country, not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of culture in, and economy and political. So we have, we have different de facto authority in Syria, each authority dominating one uh, region. And each authority has its own agenda. That's why it has it, its own economic dynamics, cultural dynamics, and social dyna dynamics. And this increase the, the cracks or increase the polarization in Syria more and more. One last point in this brief storyline. <laughs> uh, it should be highlighted is the reconstruction process and the fake, victor the fake victory that, for example, the regime uh, is claiming to, to have. What's happening now in Syria is not a reconstruction process. It's not inclusive process. The regime now is constructing a new city for a conflict elite and crony capitalists because this city will be very expensive for the majority of Syrians to buy homes and houses in it. And the destroyed cities, no one, nothing is, are happening to, is happening to them. So this is not really a reconstruction uh, process. And we believe that we will not have reconstruction pr process or sustainable reconstruction process unless it is inclusive. It includes all people without discrimination and regardless their political and economic and social backgrounds. Now moving to the economic and uh, social impact of the uh, crisis. Here we have the economic losses estimated uh, due to the crisis till the end of 2015. And it's estimated at uh, a total of 255 billion uh, US dollars till the end of 2015. And this almost equals five times the GDP of Syria in 2010. It means it, a huge uh, amount of uh, losses and needs a lot of time to overcome the impact of these economic losses. By the end of 2017, it's expected or uh, it's estimated that this loss reach six times of GDP of the Syrian GDP in 2010. <coughs> the, economic, uh, the economic losses uh, oh, sorry, this is, I cannot, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the economic losses include, uh, civil or uh, consist of several uh, components. The first one is GDP loss, which reflects the loss of production process in the economy. 
The second one is the capital stock loss, which reflects the uh, destruction in buildings, in factories, and in the accumulated investment in Syria. The uh, third and fourth one, uh, co uh, components uh, are uh, related to the military expenses and reflects the reallocation of resources from development to violence-related activities. And the final component is the loss in wealth. It's the difference between, uh, for example, when Daesh uh, controlled uh, their zor and controlled oil in Syria, they start to sell or smuggle the uh, oil at very low prices. So the difference between the international prices at that time of one barrel of oil and the price that Daesh uh, is dealing with is a loss in wealth of Syria, in addition to the destruction of wells, uh, of oil wells in, in Syria. So all these components estimated at 255 uh, billion USD. Of course, the, the destruction and the continuation of the crisis affected uh, largely the living conditions of Syrian people in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of transportation, housing conditions, uh, access to, uh, uh, to communication, etc. And we constructed one <coughs> index that could reflect the living conditions of Syrian uh, in, uh, in, inside the country, and it's living conditions index. And here we can see the map. But before, before seeing the map, if we can see the, the table, and it reflects that this index comparing to 2010 decreased by 36.6%. And this is a huge uh, uh, deterioration in living condition index. And also we can notice that the decrease in the index happened in all governorate, but in different weight. The most uh, decrease happened in the conflict zones like, for example, Hasake, uh, Aleppo, Arraqqa, and the least uh, decrease happened in the relatively uh, secured uh, regions like, for example, Damascus, Tartus, and Sueda. But all of them faced a large deterioration in terms of living conditions. Of course, uh, due to the economic difficulties, sanction, uh, the destruction of economic foundations in Syria, the destruction of uh, the factories, even the destruction in agriculture sector, we, we face a surge in the prices and a large depreciation in the Syrian pound currency. We can see here that the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which reflects the inflation, increased like 10 times by the end of 2017 compared to, 2000, to its level in 2010. And this also uh, uh, happened uh, for the currency. It depreci depreciated about uh, 10 times compared to its level in 2010. Of course, all of this affects the uh, welfare of Syrian people and putting the majority of Syrian people under the poverty line. By the end of 2015, about 85% of Syrian people were under the poverty line. And of course, this is as an average for all Syria and it differs accord, according to the governorate or according to regions, where again, uh, the conflict region suffered more than the relatively secured region. Oops. Since the economic activities destroy, we in Syria are facing a large increase in the unemployment uh, uh, ratio. Here we can see that the unemployment uh, was about, un unemployment rate was about 60 percent by the end of 2015. About 3 million 
uh, people were unemployed. And more than this, the employed people, half of them are working in violence-related economy, in smuggling, 50% of them, in smuggling, kidnapping, or being involved in armed groups. So we have now a reallocation of resources, even a reallocation of human capital from being uh, involved in developmental activities to being involved in violence activities. And this also will have not direct impact on Syria, but also an impact on the future of Syria. How, what kind of incentive are we going to provide people who are earning fortune uh, from the violence-related activities to become again a, uh, involved in civil activities or in regular economic activities? Uh, the conflict has a large impact on demography for sure. Uh, about five or six million uh, Syrian people become refugees, the, uh, in mainly in neighboring countries, but also uh, in Europe and to much less extent in Australia. But uh, also inside Syria, the, there is a huge change in the population in terms of the total number of population. Uh, it should be now, if we have the counterfactual scenario, i.e. if there would have no crisis in Syria, the total population should reach 28%. But now in Syria we have about 19.2 uh, million uh, inhabitants. And this is a loss in human capital also. And this, this loss is due to several reasons. The uh, migration, uh, the, uh, high, the large number of refugees, in addition to the uh, large number of people killed during the crisis, uh, which is estimated at half million people killed due to the crisis. Of course, in addition to the decrease in the fertility rate and increase in mortality uh, rate. This led to a uh, dramatic change in the structure of Syrian population pyramid, where the young or the young people, the group of young people decreased because most of them left, left the country and many of them killed during the crisis. So we, we, we are going to have, or we are having now in Syria, a distorted population uh, pyramid that not reflects the natural uh, development, let's say, of the demography in Syria. In terms of uh, education, we can see here a, a drop in the average years of schooling in Syria due to the destruction of schools, due to the very difficult uh, accessible, uh, very difficult condition to access the school due to security reason. Uh, in addition to the drop of uh, drop, uh, people drop uh, children drop out of school to join labor market to support their family in terms of uh, financial or to release some financial burden from them. About. 45% of children in the age of, in the school age in Syria, they are not enrolling schools now. And again, this is, or this ha has a direct impact or a current impact on Syria, but also it will have a huge consequences in the mid and long term in terms of human capital and the development, the future <coughs> development process in Syria. The accumulated estimated cost of lost schooling years is about 16.5 million schooling, schooling years because millions of students are not uh, in school anymore and each student lost like three or four years of schooling. The accumulated number of years of school 
uh, lost in Syria is about 16.5 million. And this is a huge number and it cannot be, I mean, how can we overcome this gap in human capital in the future? This is one of the main questions also that we are going to face. Health also deteriorated a lot, health facilities destroyed, health is, was, is till now being used as a weapon to have or to gain loyal people or to fight the non-loyal people. Uh, the main index that reflects the deterioration in health is the life expectancy. Due to several reasons, we can see that life expectancy in Syria deteriorated from like 70 years, 70.5 years in 2010 to reach less than 55 years in the year of 2000, by the end of 2015. And this is a large deterioration for an index like life expectancy. All this affect the Human Development Index, which consists of three main components, health, uh, education, and income. And you can see that Syria, uh, Syria's rank was, in 2011, 121, and become, become at the rank of 173 by the end of 2000, in year 2016. 173 out of 187 countries, and this is a large also deterioration in the development uh, in Syria. And actually the level of a human development index in Syria now is equal to, it, to, to the level of a human development index for Syria in, 19, in the year 1970. So we can say that Syria lost about 50 years of development outputs. Of course, all the subjugating powers uh, are investing in, in, in the identity politics. They are investing in hatred to gain more loyal people. So this creates more polarization in, in Syria, and this affects the social cohesion. And you can see here that the social capital index, which has three main components, social networks, trust, shared value, deteriorated in Syria by 30% during the crisis, reflecting this, uh, the state of polarization and uh, decrease, decreasing social cohesion in the country due to the crisis and due to the investment in hatred by all the fighting parties. This is towards sustainable peace. Uh, I'll go uh, quickly through uh, this then to, to open uh, the discussion. But the main uh, issue here that the majority of Syrian people and after all uh, this impact uh, of the crisis, uh, this negative impact of the crisis, they are frustrated. Because they, it seems for them that there are only two choices either the oppressive regime or the chaos, destruction, and the rule of different fragmented armed group. So they accept, many of them accept the rule of uh, the regime, although they know, uh, or actually they don't prefer the regime, but they don't have alternatives. That's why, and as uh, activists and as civil activists, and uh, not only internally, but also from the international uh, community, should work in contributing to create a, another alternative for Syrian people, another path for Syrian people to, to, for them to see that there is a hope. It's not only either the regime or the uh, chaos and destruction. No, there are other alternatives. But this alternative should be based on studies, research, on agreed vision for the future of Syria, and should be inclusive and based on participatory uh, approach. Of course, it's not easy. It needs a lot of time. It's a long struggle. Maybe it needs years and years. It's not going to happen next year. It's an accumulated work and accumulated knowledge. 
as I said, not only at national level, but also at international level, to overcome the, the impact of the crisis towards sustainable peace. Because what's happening now, maybe it will lead to stability. But this stability under oppression, it cannot be sustainable. The stability under oppression proved to be uh, a cause for future crisis in like two or five or 10 years. And thank you very much. This is, this is thank you for, for so much information and so much food for thought. Um, we might open it up to questions. Somebody have? Yes, please. Maybe introduce yourself before you ask. Um, my name is Sami Akhil. Um, I'm an honor student at La Trobe University. Um, and yeah, I was born and raised in Aleppo, Syria, so, um, so this topic is very dear to my heart. Um, I wanted to just kind of touch on your views on um, the systematic uh, approach towards um, having a stable and unified um, political opposition and what your view is. Towards, uh, what your view is um, towards achieving that unified block of political opposition because just like you uh, said, a lot of Syrians, um, and I'm one of them, um, share this view that we only have worse, bad and worse options. So, um, yeah, um, and the main reason of that is because of having such a fragmented opposition that is basically used as a tool by various foreign entities and just like backed by various fragmented um, uh, foreign entities that have all contradicting agendas. Um, what is your view uh, towards this issue and how can we achieve a unified opposition that actually is attractive to majority of Syrians, even those who are loyal to the government? Yeah, actually, it's, it's a very uh, difficult question, but uh, I don't think we should uh, concentrate on having unified opposition. I think it's better to concentrate on having unified vision for Syrian people, for their future. It's very, uh, I mean, critical to talk about opposition and not talking about people inside the regime controlled area because many of them, they are not uh, supporting the regime. So we need to talk about unified Syrian people for the future, unified Syrian society for the future. Now, how to reach this? It's a very difficult question, question within the context, the current context of international and external interventions, of the use or uh, huge use of uh, power and uh, milita military operations. But we need to start now. How to start? That's what I talk about uh, the alternatives. We need to start first by, it's a long, first of all, it's a long, difficult journey, but we need to start first by understanding the dynamics of the conflict now. What is the impact of the conflict? So to have the appropriate base for a constructive dialogue and discussion. But at the same time, we need to work also as a civil society uh, entities, let's say, on having an agreed vision for Syria. This vision should be based, from my point of view, but it could be wrong, should be based on values such as justice, freedom. These values that the Syrian, uh, the majority of Syrian people asked for since the beginning of the movement. So uh, we need to have a comprehensive understanding of the current situation. We need to have the agreed vision for the future, and then we need to have this inclusive dialogue and discussion with at grassroots level on how can we move from here, which is based on facts and indicators, to there. It's a long process, it, and it should not be only political process. It should be political, social, and economic uh, activities to reach this uh, institutions that meet Syrians' needs and aspirations. Let's say the majority of Syrians, because you know now 
there are warlords and there are many people benefits from the dynamics of uh, the conflict. That's why they are benefiting from the continuation of the conflict. Sorry. Oh, no. you go oh uh, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. I'd be very interested to know your perspective on uh, women's role in the current Syrian um, economy. Because correct me if I'm wrong, UNDP put the paid participation of um, Syrian women in the labour force at about 15% prior to the conflict. And now that there's a situation where women are forced into a position of being heads of households in many ways, how are they contributing to the war economy or the, the economies of violence that we're seeing in Syria now? Do they? Are they being passive? What is the situation? No, uh, actually, let's start with the uh, economic empowerment of women before the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the woman participation rate in Syria before the crisis was among the lowest rate in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was deteriorating between 2001 from 22% to less than 13% in 2010. So there was a kind of exclusion of women mainly from the economic activities in Syria even before the crisis. Now, during the crisis, women face a lot of abuse du uh, during the crisis, but at the same time, due to the loss of life of many uh, breadwinners in the family, women have to maintain or sustain the minimum living condition for their family. They, therefore, they, most of them were involved in some kind of activities. But again, they are currently, most of them, abused by the employer and working under very difficult conditions to get the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult for, uh, for women, and it's not, it's not only due to the crisis. It has its root even before the crisis. And also in terms of social structure, we have this patriotic uh, structure. So the women should follow mm -hmm. the, the man. And we need to have a father. We need to have a leader. That's why. We always have dictators in our country because women are not empowered enough. <laughs> um, just a quick question. Um, what you just mentioned that perhaps around three hundred billion dollars have been lost in Syria over the past just the the, the capital, just the finance, the finance of it. If we go assume that from now on it's going to be a level of peace, but under the under the regime for that transition until turning to something that would be more acceptable and favorable to the Syrians. Where do you think this cap, this investment would, would come back? Because I'm just giving an example that I'm from Afghanistan, right? So um, we went through that level of destruction in, in 40 years, but it is, it's, it's, it's ongoing conflict as well. But to bring that money, you have to attract um, foreign aid, and foreign aid would not come without any strings attached to it. Given the Syrian regime's status and how is it contested between the international community. W would you see that there will be opportunities for um, foreign aid that would be actually used for the construction, for the development of the country, to bring that HDI, everything else up? Or it would be from where these resources would be coming from? Like that's yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, also a very important question. But let's ask first if the regime is interested in reconstructing the country. At least for the oligarchs, probably they would. They would want exactly. To. So for the small minority of people, the regime has the necessary fund from the reallocation of resources, from the fortune of warlords, in addition to the support, the external support from allies like Iran and uh, and uh, and Russia, and maybe China will have some investment in the regime-controlled area. But it's unlikely to have a huge foreign direct investment coming to Syria under the uh, regime uh, uh, control or under the regime uh, authorities. But again, the regime is not interested in building the country. For example, now they are constructing new city. The regime is constructing a new city and not reconstructing the destroyed city. 
And this new city near Damascus, it's called uh, Mar Maratia, it means sovereignty in Syri Syrianic language. This new city is very expensive. So it's not for the Syrian people. It's for the conflict elite who benefit from the conflict. They will pay money for buying houses in this city. But the really destroyed cities are not being under reconstruction. So the question is, if the regime is interested in reconstruction, in, in reconstructing Syria, I don't think so. But in case we have a new regime, the question is still valid from where we are going to have money because, you know, capital is coward. If there is any kind of instability, no one will invest money in uh, the country. So, yeah, it's uh, an important question always because the savings in Syria are deteriorated, deteriorated so uh, very, very, uh, very much. And uh, investors are not ready to risk their money in an unstable, in unstable environment. Um, thank you very much for that. It's a brilliant amount of data and, and really um, amazing work that you've put all of this together. The, the thing that um, strikes me is you've taken all of this data and out of the end of the data what you're putting forward is that Syria needs a new vision in order to bring it back together, right? Maybe the new vision is to separate it out. Maybe there isn't a future in which Syria, Syria comes back together. Maybe it's some kind of federalism, some kind of partition, some kind of uh, decentralization or separatism, different states with the emerging within it. When you look at many of the maps you presented, it's quite clear, um, and you know I think it's been known for a while, uh, whether you look at it along ethnic lines or religious lines, that there are various compact minorities and groups that are you know, already relatively autonomous and have been for a long time. And that seems to me to be an increasing phenomena in the Syrian landscape. But out of the data, what you're saying is, no, 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 we need a new vision to bring everyone back together. But perhaps the, the way forward for peace and stability is to keep everyone apart. And I guess I'm kind of playing devil's advocate in saying that, but I'm just interested to know what, you know, whether you have any thoughts or anything to add on that tension between trying to get everyone back together or allowing people to go their own way and yeah. what that would mean. Yeah. Actually, that's why we need first to start with having uh, this research and studies, independent research and studies to understand the current situation. And then we have this evidence-based dialogue, not a dialogue based on polarization or on uh, political uh, stance. So, when we have this evidence-based dialogue, if the di this dialogue reach to the fa uh, to reach the, uh, the the results that okay, there is a need for having different countries instead of one country. Okay, but this dialogue should be evidence-based, and I'm not sure if we have this kind of dialogue now. It's very politicized dialogue, and so far the evidence that we have show that it's not about sects and it's not about ethnicity. All Syrians or the majority of Syrians in all regions affected negatively by the crisis. We cannot say that, okay, the de facto situation now in northeast region that we have the Kurdish authority, but people in this region are not happy or are not satisfied with the policies or public policies of these authorities the Kurdish authorities are uh, implementing the same policies of the Assad regime, same exclusion and s exclusion of the Arabs because, and some Kurds. So it's not inclusive in this region. And the Kurdish authorities, if I have the map, I don't have the map here. They are controlling Hasake, Raqqa, and Derzur. And the majority of population here, part of Derzur, the majority of population here are Arabs. So, and they are acting as Kurds, not as Syrians, as an authority, as a Kurdish authority. So they are excluding the majority of Arabs. And this will not lead to have consequences that, okay, this is the de facto situation, 
let's stick to it. Anyway, if we have this evidence-based dialogue, and if this dialogue lead to, okay, uh, uh, let's have federal uh, 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 country, or let's have uh, more decentralization, great. But again, I don't, I don't know what will be the results of this continuous and long dialogue. But I know that it should be based on evidence. It should not be based on political polarization. Okay, I just follow from this question of uh, what can be done. Uh, you earlier talk about instrumentalization of identities by these groups and also how the dynamics of resistance against authoritarian regime is also producing its own sort of exclusionary subnational movements like the course you talked about. I wonder, you know, what role you know, the such like yours play in this whole context? I mean, you are clearly showing that everyone is suffering, right? They have been suffering tremendously since the start of the war in 2011. But is this having any impact? Or can it have an impact in terms of countering this kind of Kurdish, Arab, or sectarian types of narratives that might be feeding, you know, conflict at the subnational level? Or are they picking up, looking at this, suppose, reading this, suppose, reflecting on this? Is there any way to disseminate this, for example, in the places where people are? Uh, you know, seeing people in both sides are suffering equally, not equally, but also, you know, suffering, losing, you know, because everyone is losing. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. As, as a research center, we believe that we have uh, the impact through the, our contribution in having this kind of understanding the dynamics and the impact of uh, the crisis. And in 2014, I'll give you an example about the impact that we may have. In 2014, in 2015, the government began to say that we are achieving a positive economic growth. And they start to sell this to international organizations and that we are re-controlling uh, the, the regions. We launched our report that proved, using evidence, that there is a deterioration, a continuous deterioration in the economy. And this actually forced directly or indirectly the regime to stop claiming that there is a positive uh, economic growth. This had also an impact, we, we think, that this has an impact on Syrian population. The propaganda of the stability stopped, and people know that it's not going any positive. It's going worse and worse. So <coughs> the pressure on the regime continued. Now, research centers in general also have the impact through informal dialogue conducted in different regions in Syria. For example, we had many dialogues in uh, the <coughs> Kurdish authority controlled area. And this dialogue led to one result, that all Syrians have the same, almost the same challenges. But we should respect the diversity. And this is accepted by all Syrians. But of course, you, can, you always have these extremists in all parties. You have 5% of the population are very much uh, pro-regime, and you have 5% are very much pro-Kurdish authority. But the majority of Syrian people trying to have mutual platform, and as researcher, and also for all research centers, we should provide evidence why or based on what this platform should be in the future. So we're talking about the decentralization of Syria and kind of um, competing um, warlords over so different areas and then how to redress that when the conflict is over. And if you look at the example of Lebanon with its um, sectarian confessionalist parliaments that existed, how well, do you think that works as a system? There's obviously many flaws with that, where basically the people who were in power during the war are effectively in power after the war. Uh, do you 
in developing an evidence base, um, look to Lebanon, for example, in many ways in the post reconstruction? Yeah, we were pretty for like a year and a half, so that's not yeah. really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually, we believe that Lebanon is uh, a very bad experience in terms of the how to exit from the conflict. It's, uh, how not it's to as, as, as you say, as you say, it's, it was a distribution of power among the warlords mm -hmm. of the conflict. And again, the, the Lebanese or the majority of Lebanese people were absent from the table of, negoci of uh, negotiation. Mm -hmm. So we don't want this kind of agreement, like Taif agreement. Mm -hmm. But most probably, we will have something like this, and maybe worse. We will have war leaders, mm -hmm. and the leader of the war leaders, who is Bashar Assad, distributing the power mm. among small leaders to have the kind of stability for, its, for his regime. So as civil society, we should fight or we should confront this uh, model or this potential model. Even if it happens, we should also <coughs> fight it, as the Lebanese civil society is doing now. Although, although they are, yeah, it's a long struggle. Mm. They so far don't achieve, <laughs> didn't achieve anything. But yeah, Try. it's good. It's good to continue mm. the struggle against this model or this political model. Well, yes, I mean, on the to talking about breaking up Syria in terms of, of boundaries, ethnic or sectarian boundaries, as a solution for me, um, as someone who's Syrian, is kind of insulting actually, um, because it, it implies that the problem is the fact that we couldn't get along, right? It kind of washes over so a lot of the root causes of the problem and says, you guys don't know how to get along, let's just separate you and everything will be fine. So when you frame the solution in that way, you're actually also framing the problem. And the way you're framing the problem is so er erroneous that it just becomes almost, yeah, um, so it just, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, sure. It's not about, it. we should go back to the root causes of the, uh, of the problem and not dealing with the results of the, and not only dealing with the results of the conflict. The results is polarization. The results is that we have uh, different sects. The results is that the subjugating powers are investing and using the identity politics. But we are not sectarian in, in general. And the, the evidence of this is the hosting community in Tartus, for example, they are the Alawi, the majority of them are Alawi, they are receiving hundreds of thousands of people from Aleppo and Idlib who are Sunnis. I think and Bashar's wife is a Sunni. And Bashar's wife and, and all, <laughs> almost all warlords are Sunnis. The Syrians so, are like, no, know, separated there, on these grounds. There is, there is a one clear fact for the regime. You are my enemy if you are not loyal, regardless if you are Alawite, if you are Sunni, if you are Christian, if you are Budi, if you are anything. If you are from Israel and you are loyal to me, you are my friend. So it's not about sects. It's about benefits. It's about loyalty to the regime. But the regime is using yeah. Sects but also the Western loyalty. media, the Western media, and the way that it, is, it, yeah, it just is portrays Arabs and Syrians as being these irrational people who just you yeah. know can't get along with each other, and so they just shoot each other. And I think that's really yeah. demeaning. And, and you raise a very important point that if we start the solution by dealing with the results, okay, we are a group of sects. We need to build bridges between Sunnis and Alawite. This is not the right way to deal with the <coughs> conflict in Syria. And this is deepening the polarization in the society as what exactly happening in Lebanon. Mm. Now people in Lebanon believe, okay, I'm Christian. <coughs> I should, okay, build some bridges with Muslims. But at the end of the day, they are both Lebanese. So. Question here? Yeah, so <coughs> you had some slides that were on the percentages of, of, of poverty rates. Um, do you have, I can't remember, did you have prior to the conflict and then? Um, no. 
No, it's between 2014 and 2015. <coughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but in yeah, please. Oh, I, I wanted to check first of all, were those poverty rates absolute or relative poverty? No, it's the people, the percentage of people under the upper poverty line. Yeah, it's, a, it's absolute poverty. And then my second question would be that, um, what are the perspectives of individuals experiencing poverty to those above, like clearly above the poverty? So let's say like in the upper quintile of the income distribution. But the reason I asked, my thesis looked at how um, being economically disadvantaged changes, or a few different types of disadvantage, but the way that it changes perspectives on political processes and the way that people think about the rest of their society. So I'm interested in, is that maybe a stronger basis to think about resolving these problems rather than across sectarian lines like you were just speaking about? Yeah, uh, actually, but uh, just to give you uh, a, an overview about the poverty in Syria. Before the crisis, the overall poverty, people under the poverty line, was about 14%. And it increased to reach 85% by the end of 2015. So the majority of poor people now used to be in the middle class before the crisis. So I don't think what, what you said can be applied in the Syrian uh, context because the majority of these people, that's why people are frustrated. The majority of these people want to have the minimum level of of living, and they are looking to have what they had before the crisis. And this is the political economy of the crisis. And the regime is playing on this. Look, guys, what where you, you were before the crisis. You had good living conditions. You had everything. You were in middle class, and now you are poor. So if you support me again, and if you accept me again, I can uh, bring you back to where you were before the crisis. Uh, now, I don't think within the conflict context you can you can apply the economic theory because yes. it's very dynamics. It's very <coughs> complicated and it's very uh, fast. I mean, changes happen very in very quickly. So most of people now are frustrated because they lost all their savings and they become poor because they lost not only their jobs or not only the means of production, but also savings. Because Syrians used to save in uh, uh, buying houses. And about 30%, 35% of buildings in Syria destroyed. So they lost their accumulated savings. So they are frustrated. They are not. They don't have now these dynamics between rich and poor, and they just want to to sustain their living conditions or the, an acceptable level of living conditions. Can I ask you a very quick question? Do you have any data on remittances um, in Syria, like during the conflict? Because yeah, the, the last uh, number that we have in 2016. Uh, uh, Syria received a daily remittances of about two to three million per day. Yes, sir. Yeah, so it's about one billion per year. But this is mainly to the uh, in the to the regime controlled area. Oh, okay. So you can talk about four million if we include Kurdish and the and Idlib opposition controlled area. So yeah, we're still talking about one point two billion. USD and this this the remittances are considered as one of the main resources for income for many families now in Syria. In fact, for your question before about where to get the money to rebuild, uh, my question is how many of the refugees who have left, who have gone to Europe, who have gone overseas, will come back if there ever was stability and bring with them income uh, and savings that they might have. In well, that is the one in Lebanon because remittances still is one of the highest. But yeah. not remittances, not remittances, but actually bring back coming money. back to live and rebuild oh. with with money, you know, with money that they may have earned or saved, and coming back to live and rebuild in Syria. If there was a, a vision for Syria, if you were able to create, you know, uh, not just uh, stability exactly. in the regime sense.
Syrians, but if there was some hope for a prosperous future there, a lot of Syrians, I think, do want to come back at this stage, you know, and would like to rebuild yeah. there and be part of something positive. Yeah, it's, it's, as you say, it's, it depends a lot on uh, the way uh, that we are going to exit the conflict. If it's a way that the regime will control everything, I don't think the refugees or the businessmen will risk their money and invest again in Syria. The investors will, will be uh, among, or, or the investors will be those who are benefiting from the conflict, the conflict elite and warlords uh, allied with the regime. <coughs> the majority of refugees or businessmen, migrants, will not uh, uh, come back to, uh, to, uh, to the country. And uh, of course, uh, there, there are also the pushing factors and pulling factors for migrants to, to, to come back to Syria. You have the uh, pulling factors inside Syria, if it's stable, but there are also pushing factors in many countries. So if you are a businessman living in Jordan, it's very difficult, under very difficult conditions, or in Lebanon now, with, this new, with the new government, they most probably will put many constraints on refugees and, my, and Syrians' activities. Okay, they will take the risk to go back, to come back to, uh, to Syria and invest their money. Mm -hmm. So it's very complicated. It's not only one way. It's not only about Syria, but it's also about what's happening in the hosting countries. Uh, well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. I think we could probably speak all afternoon. I certainly could sit here and yeah, talk sure. about it. Um, thank you very much for thank making you. the trip thank to Australia to see us. We appreciate that. And thank you to our audience for coming. Join me. Thank you. Thank you.